for the last few months, we have seen some glorious developments in the region of Antioch. A church was planted there, largely amongst the Gentiles, and Barnabas was sent from headquarters, the Jerusalem church, because so many were being saved down in Antioch. Uh, He recruited Paul, and the two of them gathered a team of leaders, elders, teachers in the church to minister to that flock there. Then at the start of chapter 13, we were told that the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And we followed them on the first ever missionary journey, sent out from that very missionally minded church in Antioch. And despite opposition and persecution in every single city, huge numbers of people came to Christ and put their trust in him from both Jews and Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas would first go and preach in the synagogues and then in the streets. And despite threats of violence and physical assault, in both places, God saved many. The opposition of the evil one cannot curb the power of God. And so churches began to spring up then all over these regions. Paul and Barnabas traveled back through the places they had visited, strengthening the believers, appointing elders in the churches, and encouraging them to persevere. And when they finally made it back home to Antioch, they gave a missionary report telling the church all that God had done through them and how he, God, had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there at their home church for a long time with the disciples. Now, we soon find out that their prolonged time would not be a peaceful time, because next we read that they were called upon to defend the truth of the gospel from a very dangerous form of false teaching that was cropping up in the ancient world. Johnny talked about this last week, but um, it's so helpful to hear that Part of the role of an elder in the church is not just to teach the truth, but to dispute and discredit false doctrine. One of those feels very positive and constructive, and the other feels quite combative and negative. But it is absolutely every bit as necessary as the first. If a shepherd says, I'm only here to feed the sheep, but I'm not going to defend the flock against wolves, that's a terrible shepherd, isn't it? And so over the coming verses, we read of sharp disputes in verse 2. Then after that, debating and disagreeing at the council of Jerusalem, and then finally declaring, this is truth, this is error, there is no capacity to compromise on these things and still call yourself a Christian. So let me remind you what this form of false teaching was. In fact, let me say to you at the outset, this will sound unpersuasive to you, but there are forms of this same false teaching that deceive and destroy even today. So don't just dismiss this as being non-threatening too quickly. Here's the idea in its original form. Chapter 15, verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, like I say, That probably doesn't sound very persuasive to us. Let me try and put it to you in terms that might at least um, make sense to you and cause you to have to think about this a bit theologically. So the Judaizers, the people kind of peddling this false doctrine, they would say, listen, everybody, until about five minutes ago, every one of God's people was Jewish. And yes, sometimes Gentiles were grafted in, were brought into the family of God. They became Jewish as they did so. Genesis 17, for example, Abraham was circumcised, but also all the men of his household, including his servants. Obviously, these men were not biological descendants of Abraham, yet they were circumcised to show that they were part of the people of God. And so from that point on, Abraham, circumcised, saved. Isaac, circumcised, saved. Jacob, circumcised, saved. Judah, circumcised, saved. The greatest king from the tribe of Judah. David, circumcised and saved, even Jesus, even his 12 disciples, they were all Jewish by circumcision and they were Jewish by religious ceremony as well. So these teachers were not saying, don't bother putting your trust in Jesus. If they had simply said that, they wouldn't get a hearing in these churches, would they? (laughs) We all know that you need to trust in Jesus, but they were adding to the gospel the need for circumcision. So become Jewish, step one, 
Come to Jesus as the Messiah, step two, and then you will be saved. It is faith plus works that equals salvation. That was their entire teaching, in essence. Now, that formula, at least, is one that you might be able to recognize is alive and well today. Very few of us think that we must become Jewish before we become Christian. But many, many people think that you will need faith plus works in order to be right with God. Paul says, no, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the gospel. Paul and Barnabas had an awareness to see just how serious this distortion of truth was. They didn't politely disagree. They entered into sharp dispute and debated with them in verse 2. Evidently, though, the Judaizers were not persuaded. They didn't change their minds. They persisted in peddling this distortion of the gospel, which is no gospel at all. And so they make a decision. Let's gather with the apostles and elders over in Jerusalem and let's hash this out once and for all. So Paul, Barnabas and a number of the believers from the church in Antioch traveled to the church in Jerusalem where they work through this thorny issue. Um, I love to imagine what it would be like to be in this room as discussion kind of gets underway. Uh, have, have you ever seen a picture of world leaders sat around a table about to work through some important issue that will affect the lives of millions? Well, believe it or not, no meeting of political leaders has ever been as important or as impactful as this meeting of church leaders here in Acts 15. Sat around the table, they confirm the truth of the gospel and they separate themselves from this insidious, dangerous, false teaching. After much discussion, verse 7, Peter got up and addressed them. He makes his case, we are saved by faith alone. Paul and Barnabas, they get up and they share that they have seen this on the mission field. God has saved Gentiles without requiring them to become Jewish. What do you make of that? And then finally, James, who in some ways appears to be the pastor at the church there in Jerusalem, he opens up his Bible and he beautifully interprets some passages from the book of Amos to show these prophecies are being fulfilled before their very eyes. Gentiles are being grafted in, completely aside from Jewishness. They do bear the name of the Lord, and we should not require of them what God has not required. And so as a result of this discussion, this decision, and then the glorious declaration, they now choose to write a letter so that the Gentiles in all these churches that have been established and the ones that will still come, so that they may know once and for all, there is no requirement upon them to keep the Jewish ceremonies or indeed to become circumcised. They are saved by grace alone. So we pick it up now in verse 22, where we read. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas. Um, no prizes for guessing why he's not so keen on the name Judas anymore. Uh, he tends to go by Barsabbas, it seems. And Silas, uh, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. So then here we have the contents of the letter. This is the settled, united opinion of the church leaders from the Jerusalem council. They officially refute the false teaching that had been circulating through these churches. I love how it starts. The apostles and elders. So there's a measure of authority in those titles. This is not Joe Schmo who would like to share his opinion on the matter. This is from the apostles and elders appointed by the living God to serve in these roles of godly, humble, servant-hearted, but undeniable authority. But they don't leave it there. Apostles, elders, your brothers. Do you see that? It's beautiful, um, relational, gospel language, isn't it? A reminder that they are all adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus. They are children of their father in heaven. This is like a sibling, an older brother perhaps, speaking in love to a younger brother. It's a gentle way of beginning this important letter. Then they immediately distance themselves from these false teachers and make it clear that what was said to them by these false teachers was said without the authority of the church in Jerusalem. We have heard that some went out from us, from our church, 
but without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. And it would be disturbing, wouldn't it? In these early days of Christianity, you don't have a a New Testament to refer to. (laughs) These events are unfolding in real time before your own eyes. There is no quick, easy, instant communication across large stretches of land. You can't just check something with the church over in Jerusalem immediately by a quick email or a text. And so here come a group of fairly official-looking, authoritative teachers. They do know their scriptures well. They argue fiercely for their corner, and they say, well, don't you know, we have come from the church in Jerusalem, and here is their message. Imagine someone saying this to us here at Mordown Baptist Church, someone coming in with apparent authority and saying to us, look, lots of you think you are saved because you've put your trust in Jesus. I am telling you, as it stands, you're going to hell because you are not right with the living God. You might say, what do you mean we're not right with God. We've put our trust in Jesus. And they say, yes, but you need faith plus works. You need repentance plus religion. That is the only way to be saved. Imagine how that might disturb you to hear that. And you can't, of course, just turn to John chapter three, whoever believes in him will not perish. You can't turn to Ephesians chapter two, by grace you have been saved through faith. You can't turn to Romans chapter eight, nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so what a relief then to hear this settled decision and clear proclamation of the gospel that you know and love. We read, these men came from us, but not from our authorization. They disturbed your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Paul and Barnabas, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a a stamp of approval from Jerusalem. These men didn't have our approval. They don't have any authority. But the men who serve you as your own local pastors there, Paul and Barnabas, who you know and love, they are known and loved by us over in Jerusalem. We are in unity, in fellowship, in agreement with them. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. In other words, these men were there. They were in the room where it happened. They can tell you, if you want more detail, what was said in that meeting, how it went down, why we've landed on this conclusion, the arguments that were made from the scriptures. They can confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. In fact, let's just pause on that beautiful idea there. What a wonderful phrase and a beautiful idea. We've arrived at this conclusion because it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. (laughs) To have that level of harmony and unity between people and God is a wonderful thing to strive for. That is what we are striving for, I think, when we make big decisions in the life of the church, that it would become clear to us what is pleasing to the Holy Spirit. We don't want to make decisions according to our best guesses or our limited human insight. We want to do what seems best to the Holy Spirit, don't we? And if something seems good to God, the Holy Spirit, then we want it to seem good to us as well. We want to get our agenda aligned with his and do his will. So here's the declaration then. This is what seems good to the Holy Spirit and to the church in Jerusalem. Not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. Now, before we jump into what these four requirements are, let me give you just this overarching truth, and then we'll see it in the text. What we are reading here is the council's request that these Christians use their freedom in a way that will not needlessly offend Jewish brothers and sisters. Use their freedom in a way that will serve others rather than cause them to stumble. So here is the truth. You are free from the requirements of the law, but you are not free from the requirements of love. The thing that controls your behavior now as a Christian is not external pressure from some law, but an internal desire. It's not a law that binds you, but it is love, Christ-like love, that guides you. And so here is how you love your Jewish brethren well. That's what they're being told here in these churches. If you abstain from the following things, you will avoid causing unnecessary offense. So yes, you're free from the requirements of the law, but use your freedom to help and to bless and to serve. Paul will say the same thing in several places. Over in Galatians chapter 5, he says, You were called 
to freedom, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So you're free. (laughs) You're not going to be punished by God if you disobey. Christ has taken the punishment that your sins deserve. You have a measure of freedom here, but there are good and there are bad uses of freedom. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. So we should do what is helpful, right? So let me go through the specifics here, but, but remember all the while, these specifics may be a little distant from our current culture, but the principles still absolutely apply. How do we use our freedom as Christians to bless others and not cause them to stumble as far as we possibly can? So you are to abstain from, verse 29, food sacrificed to idols. Now, in many cities in these Gentile territories, pagan religion was a booming business. Various gods would have their various temples, and if you wanted to please that god, you would bring an animal to sacrifice to that particular false god or idol. And so the priests in these temples would be entitled to a cut of meat or a certain amount of the meat. But of course, even the most carnivorous pagan priest can only eat so much, right? And so each day, the butchers from these cities would go up to the temple and the priests would sell great excesses of meat to the butchers at a fairly cheap price. Of course, the priests can't use the meat and would rather have the money. And so the butchers then would take the meat back to the market and would sell it back to the people. And so often, not always, of course, but often the meat that would end up on your table at the end of the day would be meat that was once sacrificed to an idol earlier on in the day as part of that kind of pagan system of worship of a false god. Paul is going to make it abundantly clear in other letters that you are free to eat this meat, as in you have the biblical freedom to do so. God is not angry if you eat this meat. He doesn't believe that you have worshipped an idol, for example. So it's not a requirement of law, but here it is laid down as a principle of love to these Gentiles in these contexts. The Jerusalem Council is saying to the Gentile Christians, look, You have no idea how much it will upset your Jewish friends if you knowingly, openly uh, eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. So there's the particular request. What is the principle behind it? You should not do things that will upset others, even if you believe those things to be biblically permissible for you. We'll come back to that. The next two are kind of connected. Uh, Abstain from blood and the meat of strangled animals. Again, this has to do with eating food that is not kosher. It's not acceptable to the Jews and prepared in accordance with Jewish Old Testament regulations. Now, you might say legitimately, hang on, I'm not governed by Old Testament Jewish dietary laws, am I? And that's exactly the point. No, you're not. (laughs) There is no law that commands you to live in this particular way, except perhaps the law of love, which might command you to sacrifice your freedom for the sake of your brother or sister in the Lord. If you happen to be in a church that is full of people who have converted from a Jewish way of life to Christianity, and you know that they will not eat the blood of an animal, and your favorite food happens to be black pudding, let's say, not only should you not plop it on their plate when you invite them around for a meal, but you should voluntarily choose not to plop it on your plate either, because it will upset them, won't it? Well, I'm free in Christ to eat whatever I want. True. (laughs) This is not about your salvation. It's about your service of others. You should freely choose in that context to let go of that freedom for the sake of your friend. Use your freedom for the sake of others. That is the point. Then the final item, you are also required to abstain from sexual immorality. Now this one causes some surprise perhaps, and there are various interpretations. Um, Some might say, Are you saying there was confusion in the early church about whether or not they were allowed to be sexually immoral? By definition, they shouldn't be. (laughs) And the answer, of course, is no. Every Christian knew that they were not free to indulge the desires of the flesh. They were not free to sin that grace may abound. They were not free to indulge in sexual immorality. By definition, it's immoral. (laughs) So what is this bit of the letter clearing up? Probably this. There are some things that are considered immoral by Jews under Old Testament restrictions that would have been totally permissible in a pagan world. For example, marriages between certain family members. The pagans might say, yeah, fine to marry a cousin or a second cousin. And the Jews would say, no, not fine, Leviticus 18. And so we're probably talking about prohibitions on types of relationship 
that would be permissible in the pagan world, but unacceptable in the Jewish world. Certainly, at least that interpretation is in line with the rest of what we've seen so far in the flow of the letter. Uh, the council is saying, look, don't pursue the kinds of relationships that would deeply disturb your Jewish friends and cause them to shudder, because you've got to live shoulder to shoulder with these people in unity and fellowship. So do only that which fosters unity and harmony between you. And so to summarize, what is being said here? Yes, it is true, Gentile friends, you're not saved by circumcision. You're not saved by religious ceremony. You're not saved by keeping the law. You are saved by grace and grace alone. But the next step in your thinking cannot be, therefore I can do whatever I want. Therefore, nothing restricts my freedom. Therefore, I am saved to serve myself. No. If you have understood the grace you have been given, even a little bit, if you understand the freedom that you have been afforded, you will choose to live in a way that blesses and serves others. You're not governed by the law, but you must be guided by love in all that you do. Love, Christ-like love, should inform every one of your decisions and your actions. And that idea very much carries across the centuries and applies to us today. Let me give a couple of concrete examples to try and help you see how this might crop up in our own lives. Um, let's say, for example, a family in the church has come to the conclusion that they will not shop on a Sunday. They won't buy anything on a Sunday. That's their conviction. Um, they've arrived at it because they've read the Bible and they've sought to understand the Bible and they are trying to live in accordance with their best understanding of the scriptures. You might have a different conclusion, but fine, that's theirs. If you say to them, hey, after church next week, we want to take you guys out to a meal. We're going to the carvery or wherever. And they say, you know, it's a really kind offer, but we just wouldn't go to a restaurant on a, on a Sunday. It's just not something that we would do. Your response to them should not be to call them foolish and bat them over the head with your Bible and tell them of the great freedom that you all have in Christ. Your response to them should be, how about Monday then? <laughs> or how about Saturday? Or, or how about any other day that would foster unity and relationship that does not violate your conscience on this matter? Though I feel free to do that certain thing, I wouldn't want to do something that would cause you unease or discomfort or to violate your conscience. Likewise, when it comes to the types of food that you eat, you share a meal with someone again, they tell you in advance, oh, I'm a vegetarian. You could sit them down with a stern look in your eye and say, weren't you there at church two months ago when Peter was told by the Lord, get up, Peter, kill and eat? Listen, you've got no biblical basis for being a vegetarian, so I'm refusing to create some bean burger monstrosity. Uh, come on over, we're having ribs anyway. No, you say, fine, my friend, let me dig out some vegetarian cookbooks. I would love to learn. Do you see that these are decisions that you've arrived at, not because the law requires it, but because love requires it. There are probably lots of examples that you could think of as well, where you would sacrifice your freedom to do what you want in an effort to do what will most bless others and build up the church. We'll just close then by looking at the response. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Again, that's a beautiful response, isn't it? You could imagine a world in which people read it and grumbled that they were being asked to live with voluntary restrictions upon their freedom for the sake of building others up. But listen, they didn't grumble. <laughs> they were glad. They were encouraged. They understood. This letter is telling us, we're saved by faith alone. Be assured of your salvation. It was purchased by the Lord at the cost of his own life. So be in no doubt about the state of your soul. If you have turned from your sin and asked Jesus to save you, you are right with the living God for all eternity and no one can pluck you from his love. That is the truth. And the people even see these voluntary restrictions then as encouraging because they now have a greater understanding of how they can serve and bless others in their family. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, were, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. A couple of questions for you to consider then as we close. Firstly, have you come to believe 
that religious practices are required for you to be right with God or for you to stay right with God. That is faith plus church attendance or faith plus generous giving or faith plus daily Bible reading makes you right with God. If you believe a distorted, diminished version of the gospel, firstly, it robs God of his glory. Jesus paid it all. What an insult to arrive at the conclusion that Jesus paid the majority but couldn't quite do it all and he needs you to come along and finish the job with your brilliant moral performance. No, Jesus paid it all. You are the recipient of a gift. Those who believe that kind of distortion, they feel very proud and puffed up and superior and self-satisfied when they're doing well according to their own kind of rules for righteousness. And when they fail, they can feel just crushed under the weight of guilt and will often flee from Christianity altogether. Why? Because all along they were trusting in themselves for salvation and not in Christ. So question one, have you believed a distorted, a diminished version of the gospel that means you will only be saved if you do certain religious things? Question two, and of course it's related. (laughs) If you have believed the true gospel and understood that you are free from the requirements of the law, Is it evident in your life that you are still governed by love? Are you going out of your way to use your extraordinary freedom for the building up of others and the blessing of the church voluntarily, not because you have to, but because you want to? Or are you simply using your freedom to serve yourself? It's not required of me to attend these meetings. I'm right with God either way. True. But do you see how it might bless others if you came? I'm not required to read this Bible. I'm saved apart from works. Fine, true. But do you see how it would strengthen your faith if you saturated yourself in the word of God? What a terrible distortion of freedom it would be to attempt to use the grace of God as an excuse to indulge the flesh. So use your freedom, even if it causes you some personal inconvenience to do things that will encourage others in the Lord and build them up in their faith and show them that you love them as Christ first loved you. May God help us all to put into practice the glorious truths of this chapter. Father, we thank you for the great freedom that we truly do have in Christ, that the righteous requirements of the law have been satisfied in him, that we do not need to add and in fact cannot add to what Christ has done for us. Help us to deeply understand what it means to have been given salvation as a free gift of grace, received not by our works, but simply by faith. And secondly, Lord, if we have received that gift, help us to use the great freedom afforded us in a way that honors the God we claim to love and serves his people well. Help us in all these things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We'll sing.